So, uh, in the last last two days, you have actually uh, participated uh, in a number of lectures related to you know basic understanding of the urban transportation system, and also use of simulation as a tool. And uh, Professor has discussed in details that why we go for simulation and then you know uh, how you calibrate the model or how you select an appropriate tool. So, today we will discuss in this lecture and the next lecture primarily two potential applications and uh, in our context that means in Indian context. So, the, both these works are actually PhD work, one of them is also a sponsored research project uh, from DST government of India. So, uh, some of the findings that we will try to share, some basic ideas and the findings, but you know that uh, each of them is actually a PhD work. So, it is very difficult to tell everything within one hour or one lecture. So, we will give you some basic understanding and then little bit of the work and the results and then there are you can interact us uh, later interact with us later and if you are interested we can give you more material so what we are going to cover is uh, what is really the bus priority treatments why we suddenly come for that and uh, who are the users or uses of the bus priority treatment why we go for it there are different stakeholders in the system. So, uh, why we go for it? We try to see that. What are the different types of priority treatments that are available and how we select something for our condition? And then evaluation of a bus priority treatment in Indian scenario. What we do, how we model, how we implement and both cases the work was also implemented in the field and the field evaluation was done. So, first you know that a range of techniques designed to speed up transit vehicle and improve overall system efficiency it can be treat called as bus priority treatment. So, the basic thing is uh, the any techniques which can speed up transit and improve overall system efficiency. That means, you do something, but not too much at the cost of others, right. So, that is what is the overall system efficiency. They could be physical improvement, operating changes or regulatory changes. Now, in the next few slides, I am going to discuss each of this. But before that, we say that why we go for the bus priority treatments, because primarily it reduces delay for buses operating in the mixed traffic environment which has got you know in a way we are saying two primary impacts. One is it reduces delay for transit users. So, you know it benefits user make the bus system more attractive and especially you know that our society is highly heterogeneous. So, uh, you know uh, the bus system is required not only to serve the mobility needs of the economically weaker section of the community but also our bus system need to attract the choice riders right so that means those who have cars but also bus is a potential alternative for them so if we have to attract new users attract the choice riders then we bus need to be you know attractive enough and one key area is the overall journey time or the average travel speed so it benefits that <laughs> From the supply side also or the system side also if you see it helps to improve uh, you know schedule adherence because the uncertainty gets reduced you know the certain delay gets reduced. So, better schedule adherence, better schedule adherence means also the increase of the transit capacity and altogether, it helps us to improve the transit quality of service. So, end of the day that is what is the objective, how we improve the transit quality of service and make the service more acceptable to different segments of road user. Now, once you think of the bus priority techniques, then it has got impact on different stakeholders. So, who are the stakeholders? First is the bus operator, 
they are operating there is something some cases positive some cases negative right but in overall sense it should be positive then the passengers then also the private vehicle users because if you are providing priority to buses then a certain amount of negative impact on private vehicle users and also community as a whole so i will not really go through each and every point of uh, this you know uh, table because you will get this copy and you can you know see those but say for example for bus per operator's point of view the bus travel time is something which is important for them and that gets impacted and as i have told in the previous slide bus travel time get reduced means there is a lot of impact on that and you know better utilization of fleet better schedule adhere and so many things are coming so there is something for the bus operator bus passenger you know bus and car travel time ratio say for example right so there is some impact on that private vehicle users car travel time delay may be impacted some in a positive sense some in a negative sense but here we are saying that it impacts different multi stake users right multi stakeholders community overall if you improve public transport public transport or the bus system becomes efficient so of overall there may be impact on the vehicle emission and you know that in in cities we have very serious problem of vehicular emission and overall air pollution is a major concern and if you see these days the no industry is really there in big cities and majority of the other things which can cause vehicular a uh, cause emission are really not present in our cities so a larger share is actually coming from transport sector and that's a big burden so this kind of things is there are overall community benefit in the sense how we provide bus priority treatments that's the next question which comes automatically so you can provide priority it may be signal based priority treatment it could be facility based priority treatment or it could be site specific priority treatment now in the next few slides i am going to discuss about each of this signal based priority is what you try to modify signals right signal means cycle phase green time right some of these one or more of these you want to modify to give certain advantage or priority to buses over other vehicles now signal based priority treatment could be again passive strategies passive priority could be active priority could also be real time priority or preemption real time priority and preemption in one sense is also active strategies but they are generally considered as separate you know known to be separately like real time priority or preemption so we have listed it in this form passive is what passive is we don't really make any communication between the vehicle and the signal controller but you know the average traffic condition you know the from which direction buses come which way they move right the overall thing like that you design fixed time signal fixed time signal is what you there is a basis for it because you probably have done uh, the traffic measurements during a typical peak hour right on a working day and then you know the traffic pattern and then you design the signal based on that knowing fully that every day peak hour also may not be same the smaller duration traffic count also may not be same but this more or less on an average realistically represent a situation so something similar is the passive priority passive priority uh, it is effective when you know urban node load network is there with simple configuration and then you have to operate with the fixed time signals say for in the indian scenario almost nearly all our signals are fixed time signals so you cannot overnight assume or can you know expect that everything will be sensor based and the you know controller communication vehicle to controller communication will happen and all this maybe over a period of time it will happen but as on date we have to still go with the fixed time signal then there are high bus frequency and predictable bus dwell time you know what is the dwell time 
So, dwell time variability you know if there is too much of dwell time variability then also it becomes an issue, but otherwise generally under such conditions you can use it. Now, passive priority again can be categorized into five uh, you know group. You can adjust up the cycle length overall cycle length adjustment we are saying you know that what is cycle length in the signal context or you can influence the splitting of phases you can do some adjustment of phase length, you can do area wide timing plan or bypass metered signal. Very briefly I will touch upon this thing. Adjustment of cycle length is what? Overall cycle length we are going to change. right? Now, if generally what we say the bus is approaching, if you reduce the cycle length, then what will happen? More frequently that direction will get green time right the the overall gap will be less because the signal uh, cycle itself is less so reduce cycle lengths to benefit buses right shorter cycle length implies early repetition of the phase and shorter duration of red phase but then there is also an imp negative impact like if you are over enthusiastic that you keep reducing too many small cycles you start to operate then there are again negative impact because that may restrict the intersection capacity and cause more congestion because you have to handle it in the beginning itself we say we want to give priority, but you have to consider the overall traffic scenario. You cannot neglect the other approaches or the other vehicles. So, overall traffic also benefit is also very important. So, cycle length may be optimized to the extent of being counterproductive of buses. Now, splitting of phases that we do not really you know change the cycle length, cycle length remains same because sometimes if you are using a coordinated signal system, you know you disturb one uh, cycle length for one signal that will completely disturb the you know overall coordination plan, even the network say network closure, all these issues will come. So, what do you do? You keep it same. But instead of giving one green at a time, you split that green and bring a different phase. The whole idea is what? We are reducing the red time between two green phases, which you know bus will use. Right? So, that is also you can do, but again there are plus minus with every system and there are certain things which you have to keep in mind. Adjustment of phase length that we can do. So, adjusting phase length rather than the cycle length to give more green time to the bus phase. It helps to maintain the optimum cycle length for the intersection as well as require less intergreen time. Shorter green time may cause higher delay and queues in the non priority. So, you give you know more green time to the approach where you expect buses and you keep the overall you know cycle length same right. So, only the phase length you are adjusting. So, more green time for the bus direction. So, naturally the more great red is going to the other direction where there is no bus. So, that suffers. So, there has to be a trade off. These are different concepts and you know each of these need to be evaluated in a given scenario and you need to try to understand the sensitivity and that is where actually traffic micro simulation play a big role. So, all the things various things what I am going to discuss if you want to evaluate them how you evaluate for a given scenario right that is you need a tool and that is micro simulation. You can do area wide timing plan. So, overall passenger delay is optimized in overall sense and you know preferential green progression of buses instead of automobile you try to. So, you know that the bus fleet is getting released, but it is getting released from one intersection should be able to pass through the other intersection. Now, of course, variation is dwell times at bus stop is really an issue in this context and which create a challenge to coordinate movement of local bus routes. Bypass metered signals it is against another way of providing passive priority you know morning peak what happens all the movements are towards CVD right. So, when you are entering into CVD you do a some kind of metering what is metering Maybe you have a signal 
and you know only at certain rate I will allow the vehicles to cross this cotton line, cotton line or screen line in whatever uh, context depending on the context. But then you do not include the bus in that queue. So, bus is a separate lane, all other vehicles will be released as per the metering, but bus can simply skip that queue and can enter you know into the CBD area. So, giving certain priority to buses over other vehicle types. Yes, this is effective, but then in the evening peak that is not possible, right? Because when you are entering into the CBD area in the morning peak, you can do that. But in the evening peak, it is a CBD area, closed area, office buildings and places, say the buses are uh, getting you know uh, generated, the trips are getting generated and you cannot apply it in the reverse direction, that is a problem. Coming to the active priority, active priority treatments basically are modifications to the traffic signal after detecting the arrival of bus at or near the intersections. So, you detect a bus and then accordingly there is a communication between the bus and the controller to make certain decision. So, it is not a fixed time, decision are based on after you identify a bus and communication is made. Active priority could be unconditional or conditional, unconditional means absolute, you detect a bus you give a priority that is kind of unconditional thing. Conditional means okay, you sense a bus, yes there is a bus, but then you see whether the bus is running late. If it is running late you give priority, if it is as per the schedule or even reaching before time you probably decide not to give priority. How much important that bus route, maybe it is a daily commuter routes taking people to offices right? or a CVD area or office area. So, you know that okay, here really it is important, so you give priority to that direction. Depending on the passenger load, how many people are there in the bus, is the bus empty, then you may not give priority, because if the bus is full, you give priority because the benefit is more. right? So, it all depends on, it is not unconditional, but it is conditional, after sensing the bus, once you know that the bus is there you check certain logic, certain criteria and then decide whether to give priority or not. Active priority again could be four types, green extension, red truncation, special phase and phase suppression. What is green extension? Green extension is simply that the green time is there, the bus is approaching and the controller detects the bus, right? that the bus is there. So, the green time is extended for another few seconds just to allow the bus to cross that intersection without stopping. So, that is what is the green extension. Red truncation is just the reverse, you are you know the red time you, you cut because you want to give green to the you know to the bus movement right, give priority to the buses. So, it is more or less same, but one way we are extending the green time, another sense we are cutting short the red duration to give priority more early green to the bus. So, here I have shown it, the green extension means you are you know a bus is approaching and you can see the signal is already green here, if you cannot see it, this is already a green one and then the bus uh, communicates to the signal controller and the controller know that the bus has reached. So, it extends the green for another few seconds allow the bus to cross the intersection. Red truncation same way a bus is approaching when the signal is red. So, controller gets again the communication, so it truncates the red time make it green so the bus can cross. Special phase is something like you know often as a part of traffic management measures considering the safety and efficiency, we decide some cases the right turn is not allowed, right. Generally, you will find no right turn, very common thing, right. But, because you want to give priority to buses, so you allow the bus to take right turn or which is that means, some movement which is restricted for other vehicle types, 
you allow those movements only for buses to give priority to buses because you know if the bus take turns probably bus will save travel time or the journey time and otherwise buses to go up to uh, two more uh, you know intersections they have to cross to take a turn like other traffic that will increase the delay. Phase suppression also you can do that is one way like the non priority phases which is not the priority that means you do not expect buses there you can skip that phase that means you know normally you are allowing that phase, but when you find the bus is there then you skip that phase and directly come to green for the desired direction that means where the bus is approaching. Real time priority yes it is also active priority, but what we are doing here that uh, here not only the priority vehicle that means it is not only the bus, but you are also sensing all other parameters from all approaches what are the vehicles, how much is the queue length and so on all the data then overall you know system you are considering all approaches. So, you are trying to minimize the passenger delay vehicular emission or maybe a combination of several factors and accordingly you are giving priority in that process you are giving priority to buses. So, the decision so far what I said the decision was only based on you sense a bus and then you decide if it is unconditional immediately you give if it is conditional then you see that whether bus is late or so and then you decide whether you want to extend green or want to truncate green red time or you know suppress a phase or what other different ways you can give priority. But here it is not only the buses, but everything else we are trying to sense. Preemption it is the most what I say that early you know period when this concept started probably with preemption. It is primitive form of active priority where the current phase is simply terminated and the signal immediately turns to the bus phase upon request. So, the I think still in Germany some of the cases we have seen this kind of uh, you know signal still operating uh, where the bus is not so high. So, whenever the bus is reaching it communicates to the controller and get a green phase immediately. Of course, it is such kind of system may not be suitable or applicable in the context urban context due to insignificant negative impact on non priority traffic pedestrian traffic and overall you know you need to see that overall high traffic volume or maybe if there are too many buses coming from all sides you cannot provide priority also in this form right. But some cases every concept every approach there is certain domain certain scenario where it is applicable. Coming to facility based priority facility based priority is that whatever we discuss till now all these strategies that will reduce the signal delay. That means, bus is reaching I am theoretically saying may be up to the stop line, but then there is a rate at or near the stop line and then there is a rate how you are trying to see how you can quickly pass the bus or it is approaching near the stop line and it is green. So, how you say how you can extend it pass it. So, it is basically the signal delay, but if you look at our situation just you can close your eyes and think of any. Uh, you know situation you can remember in urban area or at an intersection there is significant queue. So, there is also a delay which is called queuing delay that means, it does not matter signal may be green already, but you are still behind the queue. So, you have not been able to reach the so even if you extend it a few seconds or even the rate is truncated also the benefit does not reach to the bus because there are 50 vehicles standing in front of bus right. So, there is a queuing delay. So, physical or facility based priority treatment is to reduce this queuing delay. So, the signal part I discussed all strategies that will reduce the signal delay and this will try to reduce the queuing delay. Now, four ways you can provide facility based priority treatment one is bus ways exclusive bus lane shared bus lane queue jump lane these are the four concepts. Bus ways are basically the grade separated facilities 
completely segregated like what we say you know right of way A category right. Completely grid separated uh, and no signal right. So, almost like uh, you know the way the train operates most cases right assuming all level crossings are protected right. So, it is like that. So, wherever you can provide you can of course, get significant benefit reliability will be high, you are giving full priority to bus movements, to no other vehicle, but you cannot do that all the time. So, the next form is the exclusive bus lane. It is not like a complete grid separated physically you know separate facility, but it is dedicated lane provided for buses on urban arterials in order to segregate buses from the other mixed traffic. So, a separate lane for buses a designated lane, a demarcated lane for bus. Because this facility is at interrupted flow, that means still the signals will come, at grade crossings will be there, right. So, due to intersection with other streets, so the overall level of service or quality of service could be lower as compared to the busways. But still, this is better than the normal mixed traffic where there is no separate lane for bus and bus is just mixing up with all other traffic and you know the share of bus in terms of if I say the number wise proportion, the bus number is never so high as compared to the overall number of vehicles on road. So, certainly this is beneficial and uh, you know you do not need that level of huge infrastructure like the bus ways. Exclusive bus lanes whether applicability, how beneficial it are, they depend on several factors. I have listed it here, right. So, say congestion, travel time savings, you know, enforceability, local agency support, right. So, all these are very, very important because the, the, the community support, the government support, the public acceptance, these are very, very important whenever you are going to decide such kind of measures. I have often seen that, you know, even the, you know, most of the department they will say oh, it is going on. So, nobody is complaining that much, even though there is problem, but nobody is. So, it is acceptable and if we want to change something and it 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 is not acceptable, that is a big danger. So, here I have shown two photographs. It could be a full time lane or it could be part time lane. That means, part time means when you operate it as an exclusive bus lane only maybe during the peak hour, right, when there is a high demand and need. Exclusive bus lane also could be five different types with, con with flow or concurrent flow, that means in the same direction, contra flow, reversible, bidirectional, intermittent. I would request Kinjal to continue from this. Come Kinjal. So, with flow bus lanes is nothing but an exclusive bus lane that is generally provided on the curb side and that is generally on the direction of the traffic. So, uh, it can be provided in different ways such as using the, if there is a parking lane, so using the lane next to the parking lane or you can also as we said before like removing the on street parking to create an additional lane for the bus or using the curbside lane if there is no parking. So, different ways you can actually provide the concurrent flow bus lane. Now, contra flow bus lane is as the name suggests, it is when the bus is, uh, is moving in the opposite direction of traffic. For example, if there is a one way street and uh, the, the traffic from the opposite direction is not generally allowed. But to, re to reduce the journey time or the travel distance between stops, the bus may be used to operate in the opposite from the opposite direction of the one way street and in those cases contra flow bus lanes may be provided. The other thing is providing a reversible bus lane which is again uh, which is generally provided in the median side where the 
in like generally the during two time periods the direction of movement one direction gets priority like in the morning you are moving towards the CBD so in that direction gets priority and in the evening you are coming away from the CBD so th that direction will get priority in the evening. So a reversible bus lane is providing the priority to bus in one direction in one time period and to and in the other direction in another time period. The basic difference between reversible and bidirectional bus lane is that in case of reversible it was for diff two different time periods but bidirectional is for the same time period like if the bus lane if the roadway is located in a such a location where the both the direction of buses are important bus routes. So in those cases you actually need to go for a bidirectional bus lane and it is that that uh, you detect one bus coming from one side and then you give priority to the bus in that direction and then again you detect another bus coming from another side and then you give the priority. So, but you have to keep in mind that the length should be restricted because that travel time section the travel time distance of the bus should not be higher or than the frequency of the bus coming from the opposite direction. So all these things need to be taken into mind while providing a bidirectional bus lane. What is an intermittent bus lane? It is the most intelligent form of providing special priority to buses where the bus lane is provided in uh, uh, with the movement with the progression of the bus that is the bus is from the, from the traffic point of view the, it is always a mixed traffic lane but from the bus's point of view a lane is always created from for the bus as it progresses or the, uh, as it moves through the traffic tr stream. So of course in case of an intermittent bus lane different kinds of sensor equipments are required which range from the sensors to monitor the traffic flow and uh, like what is the speed and the queue in the traffic in the real time whether actually a bus lane can be provided. Then also to detect some kind of monitoring system to detect the bus's position then and prediction algorithm to predict like when will the bus enter the bus lane and also when the bus will depart from the bus lane. Moreover VMS signs and different installations are necessary to warn the uh, non-priority traffic of the bus lane that shall be created with the movement of the bus. Now shared bus lane is, a, uh, is another special type of bus lane where in some cases the bus lane may be shared by the bus with other forms of traffic which may be high occupancy vehicles such as like three or more persons are riding the same vehicle they may be allowed to use the bus lane or in some cases turning vehicles like to reduce the conflict at the intersection the turning vehicles may be allowed to use the bus lane in, in limited capacity. Also the bicycles which generally try to prefer to use the curbside because of safety aspects they may share the, bus, uh, the lane with bus when the bus frequency is low and safety aspect is properly catered for. Now all we discussed about is bus lanes. So this kind of bus lanes can only be provided where the, there is enough amount of space like the road is not, not yet congested, you can create an additional space, you can remove parking, put parking somewhere and create this space for the bus. But in most cases we cannot actually do that in the urban context in Indian cities you know already the road space is highly limited and you cannot actually go for an exclusive bus lanes in almost all areas, all intersections. Now you also know that the major uh, delay to buses occur at the intersections due to the queuing and the congestion and all other aspects. So instead of going for an exclusive bus lane we can actually provide a queue jump lane to buses. So queue jump lane is nothing but you the bus is allowed to jump the queue of vehicles as the name suggests like providing an additional space for bus only near the intersection so that it can jump the queue. For example in this case you can see that it is the, uh, the, uh, the present scenario is that vehicles are using both sides of the traffic stream and bus is stuck at the back of the queue. Now if you provide an ac actually a queue jump lane the bus can utilize the green signal it can jump the queue and utilize the green signal to make the movement at the intersection. Now in case of providing only queue jump lane there may be some conflict near the intersection if different turning movements are allowed. 
So what we can again go for is providing a bus advance area where the bus can jump the queue first and then use an advance area, bus advance area to enter the, to reach the front of the traffic signal and the other traffic are stopped somewhere upstream of the main signal with the help of a pre-signal and they are also allowed to uh, enter the main, uh, main traffic signal uh, prior to this signal, the main signal turns green, like the pre-signal turns green so that the vehicles can come near the intersection approach and clear the approach in one green. So this, in, this reduces the conflicts, this improves the throughput and it also gives some sort of priority to the buses. So in many cases, this kind of treatments have been found to be successful. Now coming to site specific treatments like uh, we can, uh, the bus actually lose a lot of time in entering the parking, uh, in the, the bus stops and again the re-entry delay and everything is there to enter the main traffic lane. So uh, what can be done is providing some kind of um, bus stop which is in the middle uh, like in case of multi, multi lane facilities it can be provided not exactly on the curbside lane but on, on the next lane or in between two lanes so that the bus stays on the travel lane and does not have to enter the curbside lane always for the boarding and alighting of passengers. Or, however, in this aspect it has to be kept in mind that the pedestrian safety will be a uh, concern and proper pedestrian crossing facilities should be provided for the pedestrians to actually board and deboard the bus. This kind of safety can, uh, concern can be alleviated by providing curb extensions. So curb extensions are nothing but say there is parking and the bus has to enter the bus stop and again leave the bus stop so there is a lot of delay associated with that. So you just extend the curb so that the bus does not have to enter the parking lane, it stays in the travel lane, it allows the boarding and alighting of passengers and then it can again move along the, uh, along the tra traffic lane. Some kind of enforcement can also be done that is you can provide yield to bus laws that is uh, if a bus tries to re-enter the traffic stream from the bus stop or from another facility then the other vehicles should yield to the bus to actually uh, to actually give priority to the buses and reduce the re-entry delay for buses. Parking restrictions, as we said before, parking restrictions can be provided for many reasons. One is to create an uh, additional space or additional lane for the bus or even near the bus stop so that the re-entry delay to buses are minimized. We also talked about the special phase where the bus can be given a right, allowed a right turn. So this part is again related to that, that is uh, where it's the safety is not a concern really for the right turning movement, but mostly for capacity and other traffic management reasons. The non-priority tra traffic is not allowed to pr give a right turn or the storage of right turning traffic is not sufficient in that road space. In that cases, only buses can be allowed to take that right turn and reach and reduce the journey distance or the travel time between stops. Now there are so many kinds of priority treatments. What can actually be successful in our context? Like in the mixed traffic context, in non-lane based traffic, there is a mix of so many fast and slow moving vehicles. There are tuk-tuks or auto rickshaws in our case, which is again an IPT mode, which also needs to access the bus stops. And the frequency and the frequency of auto rickshaws can also vary. The frequency of bus is also varying, like it is somewhere moderate, like uh, like one bus per minute to very high in some cases. It may be about three bus or four bus per minute also in some cases in Indian cities. So what can actually be successful? So we cannot actually evaluate all these strategies, like even in a micro simulation platform, you have to develop the model, you have to create these scenarios and you have to evaluate all of them. So that is always not possible, like it is highly time consuming and also uh, it is uh, it is not intelligent to do evaluate all these things when you know when all the already the literature is there that these kind of treatments are successful or applicable in these these situations. So you already know all those things. Also, you need you need to know you need to evaluate the traffic condition in our cities, the traffic and control condition in our cities, and actually do a form of qualitative analysis to identify. Okay, in 
under these, 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 these context, maybe this priority treatment will not be successful, this may be successful and so we, we initially select a few priority treatments and try to then evaluate those priority treatments further in a quantitative way. So, once this qualitative analysis is done, we can actually also identify to some extent called those. Probably like if you want to provide a bus lane or a queue jump lane, a single lane corridor will never be uh, applicable. So, you have to go for two lane or three lane corridors or more. So, though the identification of corridors is important also where the signal is fully manually actuated like the, the traffic police actually, uh, actually controls the signal. So, in those cases also it is not very feasible to go for the bus priority treatment. You select the priority treatment then based on this you also develop the simulation module. So, Professor Park has already given you an introduction on how to actually calibrate the traffic simulation models and uh, in, in our case uh, the, I will not go into much detail related to the um, calibration methodology because it has already been introduced to you. But in our case we must say that it is important to cater to different vehicle classes. So, different like the, in the traffic stream it does not move as one. So, the cars move in a particular fan manner, the, the two wheelers move in another manner, the three wheelers again move in another fashion and all, again we have buses. So, all the all these individual vehicle classes have to be taken into consideration while developing and calibrating this model. And of course, to for the realistic interaction or the between modes, you also have to take into account this aspect. In our case, we wanted to know like how the travel time is is improving or like is being affected by the priority treatments. We we took travel time as the MOE as the performance measure for the calibration. So, what kind of performance measure you actually take for calibrating the model is also important. So, probably you want to. Uh, you want to evaluate the signal performance. So, in that case not the travel time may be, but also the queuing and the delay those kind of performance measures or the discharge like the discharge rate and all those things have to be taken into consideration while calibrating the model. So, once the model is calibrated that is calibrated for the base scenario like the business as usual scenario. So, you do not know what will happen like whenever you whenever uh, you when, whenever you uh, introduce some kind of traffic management or infrastructural strategy you do not know what kind of behavioral change will happen to the traffic stream. So, you also need to validate this calibrated model if there is some major infrastructural change. So, what we planned is after calibrating the model and after evaluating the simulation priority uh, the bus priority to some extent and see if it is actually giving any benefit we go for field implementation of that treatment. We of course, take into consideration the safety and educating the general public, the bus user, the, the enforcement agency and everyone we take into consideration. We work in coordination with the local uh, police, traffic police and we, uh, we actually implement it on the field on a case study basis like we cannot actually go for a large scale implementation project, but we can always select one or two corridors or uh, even one corridor and try to implement it to see what kind of actual benefit or what is the change that is happening like what are the behavioral modifications that is happening to the traffic stream. So, once we go for field implementation and we also record the data from the field implementation, we, we try to validate this simulation model with bus priority with based on that field implementation results. In by doing field implementation you will also see some kind of violations that are happening or some kind of changes in the bus bus tra bus pattern like bus, bus travel pattern like what we observed is like generally uh, in a mixed traffic the bus was not being able to reach the curbside bus stop. So, a lot of unsafe boarding and alighting was happening like the buses were stopping actually in the middle of the carriageway and the, there was some cases of unsafe boarding, a significant number of cases of unsafe boarding and alighting. But once we provide the priority we see that the bus is actually reaching to the bus stop and the safety aspect is improved. Also the dwell time of buses gets reduced significantly by providing 
this kind of bus priority treatment. So these aspects you cannot actually simulate and, and observe. So you have to know that these changes will be happening in, uh, and then incorporated in the model. So once the model is validated, we actually apply it for different scenarios. We try to identify the factors which will affect the priority treatment and we create these scenarios in the simulation platform to evaluate these scenarios to uh, understand under what context, under what on conditions, what range of factors, what range of traffic flow, what range of uh, mode share, what uh, different other ranges, what uh, bus occupancy and bus frequency, the motorway tubular frequency, all of that, like the turning movements, under what exactly scenarios the bus priority treatment will actually be successful. So in our cases, as we said before, like we introduced a queue jump lane. In most cases in Indian cities, like the BRT systems that we know of, we only have provided exclusive bus lanes. So we have not gone anywhere beyond that. But as I said that due to space constraints, it may not always be possible. So in, uh, we uh, introduce a queue jump lane in this case and we call it as bus plus auto rickshaw, the tuk-tuk queue jump lane because the tuk-tuk also is an IPT mode in Kolkata city. So we have to take into consideration that, that they will also use that uh, bus stops for the boarding and alighting of passengers. So we, we make it as a shared queue jump plane for buses and we also provide a bus advance area for the bus to, uh, to maneuver and, and take, a, uh, take a favorable position in the lane for negotiating the turning movement or for reaching to the next uh, signal. And we provide a, provided a pre-signal for cars. We, we actually simulated with both with and without pre-signals with only providing a queue jump lane and bus advance area and also a queue jump lane and pre-signal and bus advance area. So uh, once we decided on this strategy, the next step was developing the simulation model. So we tried to, we, as you can see, the bus is, this bus is, cannot actually access the bus stop. So it is being influenced by the queue uh, the, uh, or the other mixed traffic scenarios. So we try to model that similar kind of mixed traffic simulation platform. As I said, our um, the ca we developed a calibration methodology. It was it is of course inspired from all the existing literature that is there, and then we try to cater to the requirements or the different vehicle class specific uh, behaviors in our context to incorporate into the simulation uh, uh, calibration algorithm. And we actually automated it using like we used MATLAB to actually code the program and then we applied uh, GA and uh, the fitness function which we needed was uh, uh, we took the travel time distributions of different vehicle classes. So you can see that the uh, field travel time distribution we have as one and when we did not we took the default parameters and when we did that we saw that the, uh, the travel time distribution was not actually matching with the field uh, conditions. We we did some kind of non like of course this is not a normal distribution or it is mostly a bimodal or you know, like multimodal distribution so we cannot actually go for uh, normal distribution tests but we did some kind of non-parametric tests to understand like whether the distributions are statistically similar or different. So once we found that it is different we identified several parameters and then we tried to optimize those parameters iteratively and we found that okay the calibrated model is now well matching with the field conditions. So this is just uh, an example of the pre-implementation scenario where you can see the bus is actually stuck in the traffic and um, it takes time to access the bus stop and clear the queue and all that is there. And um, then another bus uh, may be affected if the another bus is there it will be affected and it will not be able to clear the intersection. So these aspects were there in the pre-implementation scenario that is the business as usual scenario. See this bus gets affected it cannot actually clear the queue. So in other cases we provide the pre-signal here and we provide a queue jump lane and we provide the bus advance area so actually the motorized three wheelers and the buses can actually jump the queue to reach the favorable position in the signal. So 
all these buses can actually jump the queue to use the um, to take favor of the bus priority treatment. So the buses are cleared first, followed by the other vehicles. So in related to the experimental setup, we actually did, uh, we identified these different travel time sections, we put up cameras, video cameras, we used uh, actually uh, like of course getting the data is another problem, like you cannot always implement uh, like uh, full permanent uh, systems to gather data. So we we, we and as you know we are in Kharagpur, we have to go to Kolkata, our Kolkata was our case study. So we always had to move our equipments to Kolkata and gather the data. So we use some kind of portable data collection system, we used a gorilla pod and a foldable ladder which can we, we can easily move in the car and take the data and of course we fixed it and about 4, four to 5 meters height so that we can get the travel time data properly from the intersections. So this is uh, the general setup in uh, we took two different corridors one is the Southern Avenue and the Lake Stadium intersection and another one is the Deshopio Park intersection. As you can see like in this case the bus lane was provided on the median side. Why? Because there was no bus stop in the near side and the buses most of the buses were taking a right turn at the intersection. So it was not meaningful to provide a curbside uh, queue jump lane, it was more meaningful to provide a median side queue jump lane and allow the vehicles, other vehicles, non priority vehicles to use the curbside and we actually got a certain degree of uh, improvement by providing this kind of treatment. The next was in Deshopriyo Park where there is a near side bus stop, there is, is a three lane corridor and uh, and uh, the buses actually, the, the bus frequency was also very high. In the previous case, the bus frequency was only one bus per minute. But in this case, it is more than two buses or three buses per minute. So we, and even the, in, in this case, the uh, motorized three-wheeler frequency was really high. It was more than 500 motorized three-wheeler coming every hour. So we needed to cater to that and we provided a curbside bus lane, which can be also accessed by more, the motorized three-wheelers and we allowed the buses to jump the queue and uh, take utilize the and for the other vehicles to stop at the pre-signal and all those things. <coughs> so this is again an example of our implementation uh, where uh, on one side you can see that the, uh, the buses are moving in mixed traffic while on the other side the bus and auto are actually jumping the queue. And we found statistically similar results with the, uh, with the uh, simulation as well. So then the next step was to go for scenario analysis and find out the different uh, degrees of applicability. See the buses are stopping here uh, behind the other vehicles, but in this case the bus actually cleared this queue and they were stopping or they were moving further ahead of the signal. So uh, that's all. The next step, of course, was to develop some kind of guidelines or guidance, uh, which we have not published yet. So that's why I did not share much with you here. Uh, but of course, you will be able to know about this more in the letter. And you can, of course, interact with me or Professor Maitra regarding this matter if you are interested. But this is like this is what we want to tell you. Like when you want to go for evaluate a certain kind of new strategy, new technique for, in our context. Of course, Q jump lane is not new in a global context, but it is of course new in our context. And if you want to evaluate some kind of new traffic management strategy, it is very important to go for field implementation, even on a very local or even on a very case, uh, highly case study specific, but you need to know what actual changes are happening, whether the, we also investigated like how many violations were happening. And we saw that the violations, in, like the degree of violations reduced significantly with each phase of implementation. So first it was the base scenario, then only Q jump plane, then Q jump plane with pre-signal, but with every stage the, the violations actually reduced considerably. This also, in, in, this also showed the acceptance of the uh, general public regarding the, the other non-priority traffic regarding this bus priority strategy. So all these things you have to nearly know like what kind of acceptance you get by implementing this. So yeah, that is one experience that we would like to share with you and encourage you to go for field implementation even when you are evaluating a new strategy. Yes, thank you. Questions?
So, if you look at our urban scenarios, uh, there is a huge imbalance between the demand and supply of transport. And that imbalance is happening one way due to uncontrolled motorization. And we have physical constraints in terms of uh, capacity augmentation of roads in our urban area. If you look at the big cities, you know, the whole area is developed. You have buildings, you have all other establishment. And even if you want to widen road, that's not possible because of the physical constraints. There are physical constraints, but physical constraints still you can overcome. The bigger challenge is the physical constraint. So, due to this imbalance, there is a lot of externalities as emission, anxiety, energy loss and so on. Just a quick example, if you look at the supply, how the motorization is happening, it clearly shows that you know, every 7 to 8 years, the number of motor vehicle is increasing or becoming almost double. Now, that of course, the line what you see for uh, three-wheeler and uh, for two-wheeler, yes, they are big in number, but if I take out separately the, you know, four-wheeler and if you see again the recent data, probably it is also showing the same trend. So, now the shift is more from the, I would say that two-wheeler, uh, more than two-wheeler or three-wheeler the growth is really happening now in the four wheeler sector which is even more dangerous because we have very limited road space see cities like uh, kolkata we have only say about 6% of the land is allocated for road which is very less as compared to you know delhi and many other cities these i show the supply side of it you know percentage of uh, growth of road space or the capacity and you can see they are not consistent, as consistent as the growth of the vehicles that is happening. So, what is the indication? The indication is clearly that day by day, the gap between the supply and demand of transport is widening and more and more imbalance is being created. Now, there are many ways we can handle this situation. You know, there are lot of uh, demand management techniques. There are a lot of other things you can do, even providing priority to buses is also one of those techniques. And this lecture is really, uh, I cannot discuss all the various possibilities that are available to uh, you know, bring down this imbalance, right? That, that itself is a lecture. But we are taking one aspect that maximum problem occurs in an, inter, in, in an urban area or urban road network, where the maximum problem occurs? The problem occurs more at the intersection, right? Vehicle stops at intersection, delay occurs at intersections. And if you see the emission hotspots, you know, in the city wide, if you measure emissions, maximum emission issue is there at or near the intersection area. So, intersections are critical, they are bottlenecks. They are points of congestion, they are points of delay, they are points of high level of emission. So, we need to do something on intersection. Again, when you come to intersection, there are so many possibilities how you can improve intersections, right? We are taking here one particular aspect that is the coordination of signal or progression of vehicles, right? And progression of vehicle, that means we are trying to coordinate the signals. So, a stream of traffic getting released from one signal should be able to or most of them should be able to pass through the next or next to next signals also or a set of signals without stopping further, right? So, that makes the whole way we improve the corridor mobility, efficiency and everything. And this is again found to be effective for mitigating congestion and reduce delay vehicle emission and fuel consumption. This is not... Uh, you know, coming from us, but this is all well established. <coughs> the benefits of signal coordination has also been reported by different researchers, different studies uh, in terms of, you know, change in the delay, how the delay is reduced, travel time is reduced, speed is increased, fuel is reduced, you know, number of stop is reduced, crash rate even 
is reduced, right? So, these are different researchers, they have told the benefit. So, there are distinct benefit. Also, you know, uh, area wide or city wide implementation, it brings benefit. So, all is tested, all is known that this could be effective, this could bring benefit, right? But then, why we are again talking about this? Because if you find, we can say that most of the works are or whatever learning, whatever experience is with respect to developed country context. Again, we cannot ignore the aspect that our traffic is highly heterogeneous, non-land based, our the way the side friction occurs, you will never probably find in any developed country, you have so much of side friction, right? You know, whether you talk about pedestrians, you talk about hawkers, whether you talk about vendors, you know, uh, all, all such kind of things, the kind of, you know, friction and the kind of behavior that we see for our vehicle, uh, vehicles or traffic stream is very, very different. So, experiences are actually from developed countries. Even the basic or elementary aspects or elementary findings are yet to be validated in urban Indian context or similar kind of traffic scenarios, right. And if you come to specifically India, you know, we have signals, thousands and thousands of signals in all the cities, but in reality they are not coordinated. Maybe some very discreet way, some corridor, two, three signals in some places, but in general, the coordination has not happened, right? And because of that, we do not have the experience also, we do not have the required research also. So, that was the motivation for us. So, if I say now the major part of the work, this was again done uh, as a PhD uh, problem, PhD work. And Dr. Bhaskar Pal is also here, like the you know Kinjal in the previous lecture. So finally, Dr. Bhaskar Pal will take up. I will only introduce the initial part of it, and then he will take up three components of work. There are there are mainly three components of work. If you are talking about vehicle progression or the coordination of signal, the most important thing is the modeling of vehicle progression. You know, a platoon of vehicle getting discharged from one signal you know, how they behave and when they are reaching to the downstream signal. So, modeling of vehicle progression, that is where we felt that we, you know, want to do work, we need to do work. Then, with that basic understanding, you again come to a development of a micro simulation model, because that is the tool which you can use to do the evaluation, to do the test, to do some kind of experiment, to see how different parameters are affecting, how you are expected to get benefit, under what condition it may be beneficial or so. So, we had no other way, but again to take help of micro simulation and then coming to the design part of it. So, how the design can happen for the coordinated signal system. Coming to the first part, modeling of vehicle progression, we did, of course, we did the theoretical investigations. Now, if you look at this theoretical aspects, there are so many models which are already available, developed by researchers and being used by other researchers all over the world. But in our case, we used uh, Robertson's platoon dispersion model, which is also widely used and a kind of you know, like a globally accepted kind of model, okay. So, in all different parts, different situation, people try to use it. Others are also used, but in our case, we use Robertson's platoon dispersion model. And coming to this Robertson platoon dispersion model, there is one specific issue, those who are again familiar, I hope that you come from, most of you come from transportation engineering background. So, you have some basic understanding and again it is not possible to go to elementary aspects and start telling you the platoon dispersion, how Robertson models is formulated and all those things. Uh, but if you see overestimation of time span of arrival at the downstream intersection, that is a key issue 
which is still unresolved. Right? So, and that has come out in a number of research works that whenever you are using robertson proton dispersion model, the reason is well understood that overestimation of you know span of arrival of traffic in the downstream end. So, the question what we try to address is how to overcome the issues of overestimation of time span of downstream arrival while calibrating uh, the robertson proton dispersion model. We actually came out successfully with an approach to handle this issue, which you know hopefully Bhaskar will show you later. And then another thing we wanted to know that you know robertson proton dispersion model what is alpha and beta, right. So, how you can because these values are likely to change from one scenario to another scenario, one location to another location, right, with mix of traffic, with volume of traffic. So, you cannot repeatedly calibrate, you calibrate it in one situation, you go to another, again you do another calibration. At least for a similar situation or nearly similar situation, we wanted to see can we just model this parameter, modeling this parameter of Robertson's pattern dispersion model, relating it to the descriptors of roadway and traffic. So, that you say that beta is this right and alpha is this and then use the value and use the platoon dispersion model Robertson model for subsequent work. Then coming to the configuring a micro simulation model again there are different platforms which are available. People all over the world have used many of these platforms starting from NetSim to CoreSim to VSIM to Paramix they are they're all you know they are all good they are all used widely. In our case, we used VSIM. Uh, primarily, one is yes, VSIM was available with us, and the second is that in Indian scenario, if you see, I mean, VSIM is more widely used, at least among Indian researchers, <coughs> as compared to other platforms. So, already some work, some other IITs, NITs, people have used in a limited way whatever their findings, all those are you know the past research is very, very important. We do not want to reinvent the wheel, right. So, we could take advantage of some of those works. So, one way platoon dispersion model is Robertson's model and then coming to the platform for micro simulation, we used VSIM, right. So, with these two key points, we again go to the next part of it. Now, if you look at this, then Majority of the cases, what we found again the models were calibrated to match the system performance measures, aggregate measures for example, delay or travel time, Indian works also most of the cases you will find they have sent average travel time they tried to match or average you know what is the average delay that they tried to match without giving due consideration to the empirical evidences. In our case, we believe that because of the unique nature of the roadway traffic and control condition, it is very, very important to consider the empirical evidences in the process of model calibration. So, the question is how to calibrate micro simulation models giving due considerations to the piece of empirical evidences. That is what we tried to do, we suggested a calibration procedure we demonstrated that to show the application of the proposed approach. Now, once you have assessed the need for, it is important to assess the need for coordination. Now, why do we go for coordination? Now, again there are already established works which tell us that what are the things you can use starting from coupling index to uh, interaction desirability index to coordinability factor, different researchers have suggested. And if you see again, we compared all these different works like what are the roadway parameters and the signal characteristics they have taken and then different researchers, what are the things they really found could be effective to decide that 
whether the signal coordination is important or not. So, this research all the review is summarized here to say you can see people have used say signal spacing is one of the factors, approach volume is another factor, platoon dispersion is an important factor and so on and so forth. Right? So, based on this we could also using this factor we could also assess the preliminary need that whether the signal coordination is likely to they cannot tell you exactly that this much benefit you will get from the signal coordination, but they are useful to take some kind of initial decision. So, they are good for the initial decision making. Once you have done that then the next task was defining the flow states, defining the design objectives and how you do the grouping of signals. And of course, all these are they interact with each other like the kind of interaction exists that they are not like completely independent thing. So, selection of design approach and selection of an appropriate design tool. In this context again I like as I have told in the previous slides what is the research gap on the part in end research questions that we identified. Here also if you say in urban India isolated traffic signals is predominantly used and therefore, it is necessary to assess the benefit of coordination or coordinated operation of traffic signal and how much benefit how we can get, how much the traffic volume how much composition influence all this decision making and also the benefit. And majority of the signal design tool models again the model this non lane ba you know lane based heterogeneous traffic system. So, our traffic and the control scenario again is different. So, the overall work I try to summarize in this slides you can say first to do it you need to develop a database we wanted a database. Then the second part was investigation on vehicle progression, platoon dispersion how you it happens you know how the sensitivity how we can model it. So, the basic questions already I have told in the previous slides. So, what are the pertinent questions we tried to address through our research. Then you need to configure a simulation model arterial simulation model. Then using both you actually design the arterial with coordination plan, but as we have said in the previous or the last uh, lecture on uh, bus priority technique. Here also you are doing anything on simulation you need to actually apply it in the field to see how it works. So, the field implementation and field evaluation is very very essential for any simulation kind of work, because you are actually sitting in the lab and doing it right. So, of course, you take care of everything and you do a rigorous calibration, but then again the field evaluation or field implementation when you are coming with new ideas like how to coordinate signal or how to provide bus priority is very very important for you to go the field implementation and evaluation. We did that as well in this case as we have done in the previous case. And then we have a now a validated uh, arterial simulation model. Now, we use the simulation model to carry out various scenario analysis and to gain further insights which are related to signal coordination in uh, non lane based mixed traffic operation. We selected a corridor or study area in the Kolkata city which include 5 arterial links and 1 arterial corridor. The major arterial corridor is Eastern Metropolitan Bypass in the Kolkata city which is a very very important corridor and where the mobility is of very high importance. So, here it shows that how many signals are there and what is the you know spacing of the signal and so on. In the macroscopic modeling part of vehicle progression what we do is we introduced a new measure of vehicle discharge. Most of you know that we use saturation flow 
how the saturation flow is defined, how it is measured. But again, you know, our cases they do not exactly follow the lane, right? The lane behavior is not there. So, if we are saying that you know the saturation flow so many PCUs per hour per lane, okay, that probably is not very rational. So, we came out with a new measure for vehicle discharge and this was uh, also I mean quite appreciated and got published also. That is where we made a contribution. We worked on the calibration of Robertson's platoon dispersion model as I said that how you calibrate the model in a local condition. We also developed empirical model so that you can model the parameter of the Robertson platoon dispersion model relating it to the roadway and traffic condition. Then we developed some of the design charts which could be used easily by the practitioners to select appropriate uh, inputs. And we developed a new approach for calibrating Robertson platoon dispersion model primarily to address what concerns that long tail that was results. So, these are the major components of work which was done as a part of this research and as a part of Dr. Bhaskal Spal's work. This is the model which we developed. I am not again going to each and every detail of it, but you can see here you are using different vehicle types and the, you know their composition. So, you are trying to relate the alpha for given value of beta. Beta we took as a fixed value and then alpha was calibrated. So, how you can model alpha? So, we actually got the value of alpha under so many different conditions and then try to come out with a model. The can we then model alpha instead of doing it and measuring it repeatedly. So, this was again uh, this model was also calibrated, this model was also validated and uh, this, this was then accepted with all the things. These are again showing the further details, I will little bit skip and the slides you can see later. You know the design chart was there again to help you to uh, select an appropriate value rather than going to the equation and uh, avoiding all those complexity, something readily available for use, right? that was the purpose. Now, here if I come to the vehicle progression part, this is what happened in reality. This left side what I have say observed downstream arrival, that is what actually happened in reality. If you use Robertson's model, you get like this. So, you can clearly say that this is the part which is actually the overestimation of the duration of the downstream arrival. So, it is actually overestimates. So, that is the issue which we wanted to handle or wanted to tackle through our work. I will skip some of this. This again I am showing in if you look at the cumulative graph, you can see that it ends here, but Robertson model will take it further. The same thing, what you have seen the distribution and here it is the cumulative distribution curve. So, Bhaskar, I think you take up. Now, coming to the configuration of arterial simulation model. So, very uh, these are common practices. So, to start with we code the base model at a node level and then stitching it up to the corridor level. Then calibrating it for firstly at node level traffic operation 
and again validating it for node level and arterial level traffic operation. So, uh, as it was already uh, said that calibration of simulation model is a big challenge. So, in our case we try to focus on the empirical evidence and the few aspects of the calibration methodology are shown here like use of multiple discrete measures as uh, MOE parameter like measure of effectiveness parameters and estimation of the global sensitivity index of model parameters and development of new parameter tuning algorithm and use of multiple of goodness multiple goodness of fit measures. Now, coming back to the use of uh, multiple discrete uh, MOE parameters, uh, the issue is already said that traditionally we focus on the uh, system performance parameter like control delay, travel time etcetera. In our case we try to find what is the difference between uh, difference in driving behavior in our uh, in non lane based traffic with lane based traffic. The proof can be found that compact uh, group, uh, standing of the vehicles at stop line and compact another thing is uh, which actually helps to increase the vehicle discharge rate and otherwise it also reduce the queue length. On the other hand multiple vehicle classes are there. So, there is a the wide variation in uh, desired speed of those vehicle classes. So, considering all this we try to identify it uh, if, uh, we, on number of discrete measures like mean travel time of vehicle classes, vehicle queue at stop line and vehicle discharge profile. We try to focus these three uh, discrete measures simultaneously so that we can get a oil tight uh, oil tight goodness of fit uh, uh, goodness of fit results. So, and, and so that we also uh, tackle the various issues of non lane based traffic uh, which can uh, which can which can make the model more valid and robust. So, these are the various uh, goodness of fit measures which used in our case also. And some of the results are shown here. You see this uh, for different vehicle classes um, average travel time um, was shown here various uh, um, mean absolute normalized error for uh, average, uh, average, average, vehicle, um, average travel time of vehicle classes. This travel time was captured over, over a uh, roadway section from upstream of signal to a downstream of a signal around 150 meter. So, and various vehicle for various vehicle classes the travel time was extracted from the video and it was estimated and from the similarly from the simulation also for various vehicle classes the tra um, travel time was extracted. You can see here when the share of vehicle classes in a traffic stream is high in here near about more than 5 percent to up to 25 percent. In those cases we found a good a good result for mean absolute normalized error which is less than 10 percent which we can take it is acceptable level of error. Whereas, for when uh, vehicle classes percentage of vehicle classes very less it shows that there is a chance of uh, discrepancy is more. So, in those cases we did not found good uh, mean absolute normalized error and as well as root mean square normalized error. So, it is also not shown here, but uh, from the our study we found that when vehicle flow rate is more, approach volume is more, the driving behavior of various vehicle classes are become more similar. So, it shows it, it gives a very idealist very realistic representation that when in near congestion system actually the variation in speed of various vehicle classes are not different actually. They have they have to follow similar condition and therefore, they did not achieve their desired speed as per their wishes. But on the other hand if we see the approach volume is less then there is a more opportunity to achieve their desired speed. So, in that case there is a large variation in their driving behavior driving behavior also. So, this is a very very realistic outcome we found in this uh, from this study. Now, this is shows the uh, cumulative distribution of travel time of it is uh, cumulative distribution of travel time of the whole traffic stream. 
and again uh, it shows the vehicle discharge rate from the stop line and, uh, and for various and it shows the frequency distribution and for various verticals it is coming out to be similar and, see, and for the maximum Q length also it is coming out to be similar. Now, design of arterial signal coordination. So, the real challenge is that, that uh, established design tools are developed in lane based traffic like transit, synchro, sidra. Then for it is developed in lane based traffic. So, if we use those lane based uh, those design tools and the solution uh, apply we apply those solution in field. So, it is definitely we are underestimating somewhere, we are compromising somewhere that because our design tool is failed to model the behavior. So, how can we be uh, confident that we will get a very efficient timing plan. So, in that case we take the design solution for transit 7 f it is a macroscopic uh, design tool. We take that the solution as initial solution, we implement an arterial simulation model and we try to find out where is the scope of improvement. In that case we found that the scope of improvement we okay in here the when we art, call it arterial simulation uh, arterial coordination. So, here the stop lines are coordinated stop lines as well as non coordinated stop lines. In our case we found that the after implementing the des, uh, design initial solution from the uh, simulation model that for non coordinated stop lines uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle discharge is very irregular. So, implication that there is a wastage of green time. So, there is a green, but there is no vehicles. So, there is a large gap in vehicle arrival. So, we introduce a new objective how to reduce that uh, wastage of green time and ensure that vehicle platooning at non, uh, non coordinated stop line. So, it helps to reduce the non green split of non coordinated stop line and shifting that green to the coordinated stop line. So, in that case in if we shift that the green to coordinated stop line, so it increase the throughput of the coordinated uh, stop lines. So, again for then it comes the now signal timing plans drastically changes, then offset should also be get hampered. So, again for we have to re-estimate the offset and we re-estimate the offset to ensure that uh, a percentage of arrival on the uh, in coordinated stop lines get maximized. So, it, from the initial solution uh, we improved it by two measure for basically this thing is uh, we apply for under saturated flow. The first one we for coordinated stop uh, for non coordinated stop line we ensured the platooning of vehicles uh, in the non coordinated stop lines and then shifting that uh, uh, that green split to coordinated stop lines and re-estimating the offset to ensure that percentage of vehicle arrival get maximized. Now, we when we go to the oversaturated condition, so here we do that let the non coordinated for the non coordinated stop lines vehicles suffer some cycle failure that it arrives, but it does not able to clear the stop line. So, what would be the benefit in that case that again that shifting would enable the coordinated stop lines get more uh, green split, but what would be the uh, reunification for the non coordinated vehicles using non coordinated stop line actually if that he may have, uh, experience number of cycle failures in non coordinated stop line, but when he entered the coordinated uh, entered the corridor actually he would get the benefit benefit because the coordinated stop line would have the additional timing. So, if what he the vehicles from the side road is loss uh, in the extra delay. So, he will get recovered that extra, uh, extra delay when he enters the main corridor. So, in that case the vehicles are uh, using majority of the majority majority portion of the corridor will have will get the benefit, but whereas the vehicles which are not using the main corridor uh, at substantially they may did not get the benefit. So, in that case we are actually uh, in, uh, we are um, actually some uh, applying the objective so that major corridor get the uh, larger proportion of green split in oversaturated condition. 
Now, uh, if the design approach what we have discussed it is for design approach 1 uh, for now coming to design approach 2 in design approach 2 we it is completely based on the uh, simulated database not using the uh, uh, not using the initial solution since using this that simulated database again the what professor moitra earlier stated the a new measure of vehicle discharge we have introduced which is called as vehicle passing interval using that measure we try to find out how the vehicle discharge can be improved i am not discussing that design approach to it is very complex so just i am showing here now this is the approach of design approach or the flow chart of the design approach one uh, in data set of vehicle demand we, we put it in the um, transit 7f and again um, um, that from the um, alpha beta values from robertson model for various road and traffic scenario we incorporate in transit 7f and gives the it gives the initial solution and we apply this initial solution arterial simulation model and later we do the modification of the TOD plan using simulated data set. Yeah, these are the two um, objective what we have discussed the minimization of green split wastage by ensuring the platooning of vehicles at non coordinated stop lines for under saturated flow level and maximizing the discharge from coordinated stop lines by ensuring vehicles once joined in a queue a queue at non coordinated stop lines will not express more than one signal cycle for you for over saturated flow level. So, we are putting some penalties, but it is not drastic it is that for enormous time you will have to wait in the side road street. And for re-estimating the offset maximizing the vehicle arrival proportion in coordinated phase by re-estimating the offset of coordinated split. Now, this shows the result of the um, this is the distribution of uh, arterial travel time with initial uh, initial solution like we may found that in second quarter uh, second quarter value is 337 seconds and the with the improved uh, signal timing plan we found it as a 309. So, there is a substantial improvement in the uh, arterial travel time in using the modified timing plan. While well, design in design approach to uh, we uh, the design objective consider the minimization of vehicle stop delay at signal. The evaluation of arterial signal coordination as uh, professor Moitra said we implement in the uh, EM bypass the uh, map is earlier shown and this the various results we found here. So, it shows the box plot of various stop, uh, vehicle stops at arterial nodes and there are 7 nodes actually so, taking the first node as a starting node we, the, that obviously this the first coordinate from the second coordinate will start the coordination. So, we can found that uh, expect from uh, node I 6 and we at various uh, other nodes we found the, the box plot of various distribution are within the 40 percent level. And this uh, pl uh, vehicle platoon ratio, vehicle platoon ratio is the one of the measure which is recommended by highway capacity manual and it is also extensively used in various parts of the world to find to uh, assess the co signal coordination plan. So, when the, uh, it is also it is uh, the uh, uh, configured as arrival type. Here we found that arrival type we found as arrival type 4 and again like other in node 6 we found the arrival type is little bit uh, inferior. So, arrival, when arrival type 4 is we found then it is uh, favorable to for favorable condition to coordinate the signal and, and usually arrival type 5 is a very much favorable condition of coordinating the signal it is termed. Now, distribution of arterial travel time. So, here we may found that generally uh, in arterial travel time uh, bimodal distribution is found. The left distribution actually shows that here the vehicles which are arriving on green and the that is the next one which are arriving on uh, red and get stopped. 
So, but in our case, if I have long tail in distribution, that is the, the, the reason is that the long tail here is the transit and IPT mode. The very reason is that in Indian condition, specifically in Kolkata, they do not adhere to any schedule. They stop in the uh, bus stop or and wait to uh, accumulate the passengers and until unless he is satisfied, the driver is satisfied that okay, for this task stop, I get enough uh, passenger, he would not move. But what is the, uh, no, uh, no discipline in adhering the schedule? So, that is why this tail is actually because of um, uh, three wheeler and transit modes. Again, if you see the box plot of vehicle mode wise arterial travel time, car and taxi is the most uh, minimum arterial travel time and again the bike also. On other hand, the minibus and bus have a higher arterial travel time and LGB, L, LGB thriller is near about at average, an average condition. And this graph actually shows the uh, before implementation we, uh, we simulated the arterial signal time, the design solution and simulation platform and this shows and again then after we implement it and this shows the comparison of um, observed, uh, field observed uh, distribution of arterial travel time and the simulated arterial travel time and uh, the error in different quartile level is found within the 5 percent level and which validate the uh, arterial simulation model. So, we, another case we overall improve many average arterial travel time this is um, which is not included this is average arterial improvement arterial travel time in comparison to the isolated operation of signals we found here out uh, for for this field implemented uh, timing plan we found about 15 percent. So, I think with this I conclude here. Thank you. But us also, I mean, we had to keep a balance because the time is yeah. uh, fact. Sure. And if they're all recorded lecture, we cannot just.